A Second Autumn Among the many scientific researches undertaken by my father in rare periods of peace and inner serenity, between the blows of disasters and catastrophes in which his adventurous and stormy life abounded, studies of comparative meteorology were nearest to his heart, particularly those of the climate of our province, which had many peculiarities. It was my father who laid the foundations of a skilful analysis of climatic trends. His outline of general systematics of the autumn explained once and for all the essence of that season, which in our provincial climate assumed a prolonged, parasitical and overgrown form known also by the name of Chinese summer extending far into the depths of our colourful winters. What more can I say? My father was the first to explain the secondary, derivative character of that late season, which is nothing other than the result of our climate, having been poisoned by the miasmas exuded by degenerate specimens of Baroque art, crowded in our museums. That museum art, rotting in boredom and oblivion, and shut in without an outlet, ferments like old preserves, oversugars our climate, and is the cause of this beautiful malarial fever, and this extraordinary delirium to which our prolonged autumn is so agonizingly prone. For beauty is a disease, as my father maintained. It is the result of a mysterious infection, a dark forerunner of decomposition, which rises from the depth of perfection and is saluted by perfection with signs of the deepest bliss. A few factual remarks about our provincial museum might be apposite here. Its origins go back to the 18th century, and it stems from the admirable collecting zeal of the Order of St. Basil, whose monks bestowed their treasure on the city, thus burdening its budget with an excessive and unproductive expense. For a number of years, the Treasury of the Republic, having purchased the collection for next to nothing from the impoverished order, ruined itself grandly by artistic patronage, a pursuit worthy of some royal house, but already the next generation of city fathers, more practical and mindful of economic necessities, after fruitless negotiations with the curators of an archducal collection to whom they'd tried to sell the museum, closed it down, dismissed its trustees, and granted the last keeper a pension for life. During these negotiations, it has been authoritatively stated by experts, the value of the collection had been greatly exaggerated by local patriots. The kindly fathers of St. Basil had, in their praiseworthy enthusiasm, bought more than a few fakes. The museum did not contain even a single painting by a master's hand, but owned the whole oeuvre of third- and fourth-rate painters, whole provincial schools, known only to specialist art historians. A strange thing, the kindly monks had militaristic inclinations, and the majority of the paintings represented battle scenes. A burnt golden dusk darkened these canvases, decayed with age. Fleets of galleons and caravels and old forgotten armadas mouldered in enclosed bays, their swelled sails carrying the majestic emblems of remote republics. Under smoky and blackened varnishes, hardly visible outlines of equestrian engagements could be discerned. Across the emptiness of sun-scorched plains under a dark and tragic sky, cavalcades passed in an ominous silence balanced on the left and right by the distant flashes and smoke of artillery. In paintings of the Neapolitan school, a sultry, cloudy afternoon grows old in perpetuity, as if seen through a bottle darkly. 
A pale sun seems to wilt under one's eyes in those landscapes, forlorn as if on the eve of a cosmic catastrophe. And this is why the ingratiating smiles and gestures of dusky fisherwomen selling bundles of fish to wandering comedians seem so futile. All that world has been condemned and forgotten a long time ago. Hence the infinite sweetness of the last gestures that alone remain, frozen forever. And deeper still in that country, inhabited by a carefree race of merrymakers, harlequins and birdmen with cages, in that country without any reality or earnestness, Small Turkish girls with fat little hands pat honey cakes lying in rows on wooden boards. Two boys in Neapolitan hats carry a basket of noisy pigeons on a pole that sways slightly under the burden of its cooing, feathered load. And still further in the background, on the very edge of the evening, on the last plot of soil, where a wilting bunch of acanthus sways on the border of nothingness. The last game of cards is still being played before the arrival of the already looming darkness. That whole lumber room of ancient beauty has been subjected to painful distillation under the pressure of years of boredom. Can you understand? My father used to ask the despair of that condemned beauty of its days and nights. Over and over again it had to rouse itself to fictitious auctions, stage successful sales and noisy crowded exhibitions, become inflamed with wild gambling passions, await a slump, scatter riches, squander them like a maniac, only to realise on sobering up that all this was in vain, that it could not get anywhere beyond a self-centred perfection, that it could not relieve the pain of excess. No wonder that the impatience and helplessness of beauty had at last to find its reflection in our sky, that it therefore glows over our horizon, degenerates into atmospheric displays, into these enormous arrangements of fantastic clouds I call our second or spurious autumn. That second autumn of our province is nothing but a sick mirage projected through an expanse of radiation into our sky by the dying, shut-in beauty in our museums. Autumn is a great touring show, poetically deceptive, an enormous purple-skinned onion disclosing ever new panoramas under each of its skins. No centre can ever be reached. Behind each wing that is moved and stored away, New and radiant scenes open up, true and alive for a moment, until you realise that they are made of cardboard. All the perspectives are painted, all the panoramas made of board, and only the smell is authentic, the smell of wilting scenery, of theatrical dressing rooms, redolent of grease paint and scent. And at dusk, there is disorder and chaos in the wings, a pile-up of discarded costumes among which you can wade endlessly as if through yellowed fallen leaves. There is great confusion. Everybody is pulling at the curtain ropes and the sky, a great autumnal sky, hangs in tatters and is filled with the screeching of pulleys. And there is an atmosphere of feverish haste of belated carnival, a ballroom about to empty in the small hours, a panic of masked people who cannot find their real clothes. Autumn, the Alexandrian time of the year, collecting in its enormous library 
the sterile wisdom of 365 days of the sun's race. Oh, those elderly mornings, yellow like parchment, sweet with wisdom like late evenings. Those forenoons, smiling slyly like wise palimpsests, the many-layered texts of yellowed books. Ah, days of autumn, that old crafty librarian groping his way up ladders in a faded dressing gown and trying spoonfuls of sweet preserves from all the centuries and cultures. Each landscape is for him like the opening chapter of an old novel. What fun he has letting loose the heroes of old stories under that misty, honey-coloured sky into an opaque and sad late sweetness of light. What new adventures will Don Quixote find at Soplitzo? How will Robinson Crusoe fare upon his return to his native Drohobich? On close, immobile evenings, golden after fiery sunsets, my father read us extracts from his manuscript. The flow of ideas allowed him sometimes to forget about Adela's ominous presence. Then came the warm winds from Romania, establishing an enormous yellow monotony, a feel of the south. The autumn would not end, like soap bubbles, days rose ever more beautiful and ethereal, and each of them seemed so perfect that every moment of its duration was like a miracle, extended beyond measure and almost painful. In the stillness of those deep and beautiful days, the consistency of leaves changed imperceptibly until one day all the trees stood in the straw fire of completely dematerialized leaves in a light redness, like a coating of coloured confetti, magnificent peacocks and phoenixes. The slightest move or flutter would cause them to shed the splendour of their plumage, the light, molted, superfluous, leafy feathers. Thank you.